Hello and welcome to the Node.js with SQL course. This is one of the most comprehensive courses on Node around. By the end of this course, you'll have a solid understanding of Node. You'll also learn how to use an SQL database with your sites and applications. Node can be used for a lot of things, but the main goal of this course is to be able to build scalable websites. You'll not only learn how to use Node, but you'll learn the best practices. I've been developing websites for over six years now. Throughout those years, I've learned what has and what hasn't worked. All code presented in this course is organized in a way that makes sense. No sloppy code. Everything is clear, clean, and concise. With that being said, let's take a look at what you can expect to learn throughout this course. Currently, you're in section 1. In this section, you'll learn about text editors and how to use the command line. If you have those two things ready, then you can skip this section and move right along to the next one. Then, in section 2, you'll learn about Node and how it works. This section contains the absolute fundamentals to using Node. This includes how to use modules, understanding errors, and you'll even learn some new features of JavaScript. Moving right along, in Section 3, you'll learn about how to create your very first web server. The server will be very basic and will use it to display a simple web page. This will be in pure Node. We aren't going to use any frameworks or tools. This is so you can learn what's going on behind the scenes once we start using a framework. Afterwards, in Section 4, we'll begin creating our first real application. You'll learn about MVC frameworks, routing, and template engines. What makes this course stand out is that we'll be using the latest JavaScript features right away. In this section, this is where you'll begin to learn the best ways to organize your code. Later in Section 5, we'll introduce SQL into the mix. You'll learn how to store and create data using an SQL database. We'll continue building the application we started on in the previous section by introducing authentication and registration. This will introduce you to a lot of concepts such as hashing, encryption, and security. Next, in Section 6, you'll learn about middleware and how they can make our code reusable and more organized. We'll also talk more about SQL, such as factories, looping through data, and displaying that data onto the page. We'll talk about formatting dates and pagination. In Section 7, we'll begin talking about database relationships. This is one of the strengths of using an SQL database. You'll learn how to connect different pieces of data together. There will be a lot of examples on how to use relationships and how to establish them. Lastly, in Section 8, we'll dive into other topics that may have been skipped over. This includes how to search through data using patterns, translations, creating your own custom commands, and handling errors. We'll also take the time to talk about some of the inner workings of the framework we're using and how certain queries work. There's a lot of information to go through here, but don't worry. I will walk you through every step of the way. Before you take this course, there are a couple of things you'll need to know. First, you need a solid understanding of HTML and CSS. This course doesn't focus so much on the HTML and CSS. You'll actually be provided a template to get started, so it would be beneficial to know those technologies. You'll also need a text editor that can be used to write HTML, CSS, and JavaScript. I actually talk about text editors in the next lecture, just in case you're unsure. It's also required that you know JavaScript. Since this is a Node.js course, you're not expected to know Node itself, but you do need to know the fundamentals of JavaScript. This includes variables, conditional statements, functions, objects, etc. Lastly, you'll need a healthy thirst for learning. There's a lot of information to go around, so be sure you're ready. Once you're ready, move on to the next lecture. I want to take a moment to talk about text editors. There are a lot of them out there and most of them support Node.js. If you have a text editor that you like and want to continue using, then by all means, use it. However, if you're unsure which one to use, then just follow along with me. There is one particular option which I highly recommend and that is Visual Studio Code. In the resource section of this lecture, 
I provide a link to this product. Visual Studio Code is an editor by Microsoft. This editor comes with a lot of great features for web development. I'll talk more about those features in just a moment, but I want to give a few honorable mentions. Another text editor is Atom by GitHub. If you don't know what GitHub is, GitHub is a site where developers can upload and share their code. This editor is open source and comes with a lot of plugins provided by the community. A similar editor to Atom is Brackets by Adobe. Another really great editor that is also open source and aimed at web developers. Lastly, you can also check out Sublime Text. Sublime is a premium editor, but they do provide a free trial. All right, let's begin exploring Visual Studio Code. This is the editor I'll be using for the majority of this course, and I want to take the time to talk about its features because you'll see me using them often. I sometimes get questions by students who often wonder why certain things appear and what they mean. Right now, I have Visual Studio opened, and I'm currently viewing a JavaScript file. You don't have to worry about what's going on here or what this code means. This is just an example. So the first feature that I want to show you is called code folding. Code folding is the ability to minimize code. It's a very simple feature that most editors come with. When you're working with large files, it can be quite cumbersome to have to scroll up and down constantly. To make life easier, you can hover your mouse right next to these line numbers. You'll then see some boxes with minus symbols appearing. These buttons allow you to minimize parts of your code. It's important to note that only blocks of code can be minimized. As you can see here, these buttons only appear on lines with functions, conditional statements, or blocks of code. I'm going to press this button and you'll see that the code disappears. However, it has not been deleted or moved. The code has simply been minimized. We don't have to make big scrolls around the file anymore. If you take a closer look, you'll see that the line numbers also get skipped. This indicates that there is code that's minimized. To view the minimized code, we can click on one of two locations. First is this plus button next to the line numbers minimized. The other location is on the line itself. Usually near the end of the line, you'll see this box with three small dots inside. If you click on it, then you'll see the code pop up again. That's code folding, a very simple feature, but extremely helpful. The next feature I want to show you is the ability to search through code. We'll be working with a lot of files and nested directories throughout this course. The benefit of a complex structure is that our code becomes more organized and easier to manage. The problem is that sometimes you may forget where certain things are created over time. Visual Studio can help you by searching through the files for you rather than doing it yourself. To search for files, you can click on the search icon all the way to the left. Then you just input what you want to search for. I'm going to search for the word create and press enter. Right away, Visual Studio Code will scan all files in all directories and return a list of results. I'm going to click on the very first one. Visual Studio will open up that file and take it to the line number where that result was found. It'll also highlight that search result for you. So that's how you would search for code. One last feature I want to show you is the terminal. Right under the view menu, you'll find an option called Integrated Terminal. After selecting this option, you'll find a small terminal open up in the bottom left corner. Node can run through the command line and you'll actually learn how to use it in the next lecture. Don't worry if you have no knowledge of this. I do explain it in the next lecture. Another way to access the terminal is by clicking this button on the bottom right corner. This will open up the problems window, but you can switch to the terminal tab to view it. All right, that does it for now. Hopefully you feel a little more comfortable with Visual Studio Code. The command line can be very intimidating, especially if you're new to web development. However, you will need to know your way around if you plan on learning Node.js. So that's what you'll be learning in this lecture. The command line is extremely powerful, but you actually don't need to know every feature there is. There are dozens of commands, but we'll only be learning a handful. 
The reason being is because we don't need to know the other commands or even use them. You don't have to be a master at using the command line, especially when it comes to Node.js. The commands I teach you here will be the only commands you'll need for the rest of this course. So let's get started. The very first thing you'll want to do is open up the command line. The command line can be opened up by searching for the phrase command prompt if you're on a Windows machine. If you're on a Linux or Mac, then this will be called terminal. The command line is just this basic window with a black background and white text. Before there were ever websites and user interfaces, we had the command prompt. Everything you ever wanted to do would be done through the command prompt. The reason you would use a command prompt is because it's 10 times faster than using an interface. We don't really need an interface for everything, and as web developers, we want to do everything as fast as we can. Not only that, web servers themselves generally don't have interfaces. So learning how to use the command line is beneficial. If you're on a Windows machine, then you're faced with a major disadvantage. The command prompt doesn't use the exact same commands as Linux or Mac. This is a problem as most tutorials and resources use Unix-like commands. This has been a problem for a very long time. However, Microsoft developed another command line called PowerShell. I want you to search for that and open it up. The PowerShell is a newer and faster command line than the command prompt. Not only is it faster, but it has the exact same commands as the Unix-like systems. We'll be using the PowerShell for the rest of this lecture so you don't have to memorize two different commands for the same thing. When you first open up the command line, you won't see much initially. You'll just see where you are in your directory. Some command lines will have a dollar sign to indicate that anything after that sign is user input, aka your own commands or text. Right now, I'm able to see my full path. I'm inside the C slash users slash Jack directory. Some command lines will not even show you the full path. The reason for this is to save some space. You may be in a directory that has a long name, and it would be kind of annoying to have to see it for every line on the command prompt. If you ever want to see the full path, then you simply type in pwd. pwd is short for present working directory. Upon entering this command, you'll see the full path you're currently in. This is super useful, especially if you can't use something like the Explorer to tell you exactly where you are. Now that we have an idea of where we are, let's learn how to navigate around. Before you can navigate around, you have to know where you can navigate to. The next command you need to know is the ls command. This command is short for the word list. Enter this command. This will output a list of files and folders currently in the directory you're working in. As you can see here, I have all these files and folders along with information about when the last time each file was modified and their permissions. Now that I have an idea of where I am, let's move into a folder. To move into a folder, you need to use the cd command, which is short for change directory. After this command, you have to input the name of the directory you'd like to move into. I want to move into the music directory, so I'll input that and press enter. And just like that, I'm inside the music directory. If I wanted to move back, I would have to use the cd command, but this time, I would have to input two dots, like so. Two dots represent up one directory. This command will move you up one directory. We are now back to where we started. If I wanted to move up multiple directories, then I would just input dot dot slash dot dot. This will take me all the way up to the root of my drive. You can use the forward slashes to indicate that you'd like to move through multiple directories. This also applies to moving into directories. I'm going to move back into the folder we were in. I'm going to input cd users slash jack. The actual directory to your folder may be different. If you're not completely sure where it is, then it's fine to cheat. You can open up the file explorer and check where the full path is. Once you know where the path is, then you just need to use the ls and cd commands to help you navigate your way around the command line. Another cool trick if you're on a Windows machine, you can click on this file button and you'll see an option for the PowerShell. 
This will not only open up the PowerShell, but also put you in the current directory you're in. I'm going to go back to my drive. If you're in a really nested directory, then typing all these dots can become a pain really quick. Luckily, you can type in cd backward slash. This will move us to the root of the drive. There's one last command I want to use, and that's the mkdir command. This command is short for make directory. This will create a folder. I want to create a folder called node. Enter this command and a new folder should be made. Let's double check this now. I want you to open up your editor and then open up this directory inside your editor. Alright, I'm inside my editor and it's pointed to this newly created folder. We'll be working inside this folder for the rest of this course. I do want to highlight that it's not required that you name your folder this. Node will work with any directory you create. There is no required naming structure. That's basically it when it comes to commands. Not much to it, honestly. These commands will help you navigate around the command line. There's other commands that will help with modifying and deleting files, but you don't need to know those since we'll be working in an editor most of the time. If you have Visual Studio Code like me, you'll have the option to open up the terminal inside the editor. One of the great things about this is that it automatically points to the current directory you're in. This is a huge time saver as we don't have to use the cd command every time we wanted to move into this directory. I'll be using this terminal throughout the rest of this course. If you don't have it, then that's fine. You can continue using the command line your operating system has provided you. In this lecture, we'll be exploring Node.js. To get started, we first have to install Node. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to the official Node.js site. And down below, you'll find a short description about what Node is. Let's read it together. Node.js is a JavaScript runtime built on Chrome's V8 JavaScript engine. Let's stop right there. A common misconception that people have about Node.js is that it's a programming language, but it's actually not. The first thing we need to understand is this part that says Chrome's V8 JavaScript engine. When JavaScript was first introduced, it was exclusively for browsers. It's probably how you learned it. With that being said, as time went on, it's become a language that can be used on any device for any purpose. The team behind Google Chrome decided to release the engine that reads and understands JavaScript code. This is what's called the Chrome V8 JavaScript engine. You'll even see that Node provides a link to this engine. Let's check it out. This engine is open source and free, so you're completely allowed to check out the code. This is what Node is built on top of. This engine does not do anything by itself. It's more of a foundation that will take care of parsing JavaScript code. To illustrate this better, take a look at this image. Basically, the V8 engine takes care of understanding things like variables, functions, objects, and all the fundamental stuff for JavaScript. Node is a program that extends this by adding features such as reading files, creating web servers, and so much more. All code you write will run through Node, which also runs your code through the V8 engine, and eventually it will be turned into machine code. Machine code is basically what servers or systems can understand. It's not very important that you know what machine code is since Node takes care of that process for you. Node and the V8 engine are coded in C++. You do have the option of adding in your own features, but that's not very common. The point of using Node.js is so that you can do things by using JavaScript. So to go back to that sentence we read earlier, Node is a program that allows you to use JavaScript code and it's built on top of Chrome's V8 JavaScript engine. Alright, let's continue reading the sentence. Node.js uses an event-driven, non-blocking I.O. model that makes it lightweight and efficient. This is probably the most confusing sentence out of them all. As you may know, JavaScript basically runs on events. For example, you may run code when a user clicks on an element on the page. That click is an event. There's also hover events, keyboard events, and events for when certain things are loaded. All of these actions are events. 
This same concept applies to Node as well. Some examples would be file uploads, database queries, and a user visiting your site. All of these are events, and you would be able to run code during any of these events. So that's what Node means when it says it's event-driven. This last part right here, where it says non-blocking I.O. model, is a bit hard to explain with words, so I'll be skipping it for now. In the next couple of lectures, we'll explore what this exactly means. Actually, as this course progresses, you'll be able to better understand what Node is and how it functions. Alright, let's look at this last sentence that says, Node.js Package Ecosystem NPM, is the largest ecosystem of open source libraries in the world. One of the greatest benefits of using Node is its massive library of third-party packages. A package is a group of files that you can download and include in your projects. Node provides a link here where you can check out all the packages available. Let's take a look. You'll be taken to a site called NPM. NPM used to be short for Node Package Manager, but over the years, some packages have become so advanced that the phrase NPM lost its meaning. This is why you'll see this strange phrase on the top left. If you click it, you'll see it changes. Nothing really significant. It's all a joke. Anyway, you'll find all the packages available for Node. If you scroll down, NPM will tell you some of the most popular packages available. Let's check out the Express package. Express is a framework for building web applications. I'm not a huge fan of it and I'll explain why in a future lecture. There is another framework we'll be using as our primary framework. I'll talk more about that later. On this page, you'll find information on how to use this package, how to install it, and other useful info. Feel free to look around. So that's NPM and Node in a nutshell. Now that we have some kind of understanding about what Node is, let's actually download it. Down below, you will usually find two links to download Node. Both of these versions are stable. For this course, I'll be using Node 9. If you see a newer version of Node, then I actually highly recommend you download it. So if you see Node 10 or 11, then it's alright if you use those versions. Node has a pretty big file size, so it may take a while for some of you. While it's downloading, let's talk about what this LTS means and why you'll see old versions available for download. LTS is short for Long Term Support. One of the great things about Node is that upgrading between versions is really easy. Going from 6 to 7 and 7 to 8 causes minimal errors in any applications. Usually Node implements new features rather than removing or changing them. I'm not saying that it doesn't happen, but the team behind Node makes upgrading as painless as possible. Sometimes developers tend to think that each version introduces a whole new language, but that's not entirely true. Usually breaking changes takes hours to fix, nothing really drastic. However, for bigger applications, this process can take some time. Due to this, Node introduces long-term support. Versions that have LTS simply means that those versions will no longer have any features added to them. Instead, they will receive bug and security fixes. Right below these download links, you'll find a link to check out the release schedule. Let's check it out. As you'll see, most versions get an LTS lifespan of 3 years. That's usually enough time for those bigger applications to update their code base. If you scroll down a little further, you'll find that Node goes into detail about what LTS is and what you can expect in the future. This transparency really makes it easier to understand where Node is heading and what's going on. Alright, at this point, Node should be finished downloading. Let's go through the installation together. The installation really isn't anything special, you can just go through the default installation. At the start, Node will check if your computer can handle Node. This may take a while, but generally, most computers can handle Node. Once you're set, just go through everything with the default settings. If you need to change something, then feel free to do so. Usually the default works fine for most of you. You may be asked for more permissions, and just let Node do what it wants.
All right, Node is finished installing for me. Once installed, you will be provided with a program called Node.js. Open up that program. You can usually tell you opened it up by looking for this little icon of Node at the top left. This program creates a temporary JavaScript environment. Most beginners tend to confuse this with the command line, but that's not the case. You cannot run commands inside this program. For example, if I were to input the command cd, then I'll receive an error. This program here allows you to write JavaScript code without having to use a text editor. So I can input console.log 5 and that should output the number 5. And generally, you won't use this unless you want to test out some things really quick and play around with Node. For this course, we'll be using commands to process JavaScript files. Close this program as we won't be using it at all throughout this course. Open up your command line. I'll be using the one my text editor provides, which is Visual Studio Code. Before you continue on, make sure you have a new instance of the command line opened. If you have the command line opened during the installation of Node, then you may receive problems. The commands I'll be introducing aren't available until after you restart the command line. Alright, after installing Node, you'll be provided with a couple of commands you can use anywhere. For this course, I'll be working inside a folder called Projects. This isn't a required folder name, but I do recommend you have a special directory in your computer just for Node projects. I currently don't have any files, but that's not important right now. To make sure Node is working, I'm going to input the command node-v. Upon entering this command, you should see the version of Node appearing. The Node command was created for us when we installed Node. This dash V right here is what's called a flag or option. Options are a way to change the behavior of how a command works. Not all commands have options. It's up to the developer of the command if they want to provide options. Some options come in one of two forms. You'll sometimes see options come with two dashes instead of one. There's no difference between the two. It's all preference to the developer of the command. Now that we've confirmed that Node is working, let's actually run it. You can start off by just typing in Node. By typing this in, you will turn your command line into a JavaScript environment. This is the exact same thing as running the Node.js program by itself. You can type in JavaScript functionality, but you cannot type in commands. To go back into the command line, you just press Ctrl C on your keyboard. Of course, this really isn't that great because it really limits what we can do. Working on larger projects would also be hard to maintain using the node command by itself. Luckily, we can use the node command to execute JavaScript files. I'm going to create a file named index.js. Once again, this isn't a required file name. You can name your JavaScript files whatever you want, just as long as they are JavaScript files. So I could call this something like dinosaur.js or server.js. Both of these would be valid names. Inside this file, I'm going to keep things simple. I'm going to create a variable named num and set its value to 5. Then I'm going to console.log the variable. Nothing really complex. If we run this file, we should see the output being 5. To run this file with node, we can use the command in node followed by the file name. In this case, it would be index.js. Before you run this command, there are a couple of things I want to highlight. Commands can take input. You can think of these as parameters for functions. The main difference is, is that you don't have to add parentheses or use commas to separate your values. You would usually use spaces to separate arguments. In this example, I'm telling Node I wanted to run a file. Another thing I want to highlight is that you don't have to pass in the extension .js as Node will automatically assume you want to run a JavaScript file anyway. So we can safely remove this from the command. The last thing I want to highlight is that this will only work if we're in the same directory as the file. 
Right now, I'm inside the projects folder, and that's where this index.js file is located. If I were in a different location in my command line, then this will not work. I'll talk more about this in just a moment, but let's run this command. As expected, we get the number 5 being outputted. Congrats, you just ran your very first node file. What node did was taken your input and ran that file like you wanted. All code inside this JavaScript file was executed line by line. After running this, Node will then exit out of its environment and continue to let you run your commands. So let's talk about that same directory issue I mentioned earlier. I'm going to run the cd command and move up one directory. Then I'll try running the exact same command again. After running this command, we'll get an error. Let's read this together. It says, cannot find module. Then it proceeds to give us the full path to that file it was trying to run. As you can see, this is the incorrect path to the file. So that's something important to know. Node will work anywhere in your system. You can have any file structure you wish, but you need to run the node command in the same directory as the file you want to run. If, for whatever reason, you're in some complex project and unable to access that project directory, then you have the option of passing in the full directory, like so. Node, projects, slash index. This will also work. However, I always prefer to be in the same directory so I don't have to type as much. That wraps it up for this lecture. We learned a lot about Node and how to use it. It's pretty simple. I know the command line can be a bit intimidating, but you will get used to it. Welcome to the first sidebar. Sidebars are lectures that aren't necessary to watch, but the information presented in them are useful for future lectures. In this sidebar, we'll talk about variables, constants, and let. If you have a good understanding of these features, then feel free to skip this lecture. In this lecture, we're going to start talking about the changes to variables. Make sure any code inside this file is commented out. So, as you may know, variables are created using the var keyword. I'm going to create a variable named foo and assign it to the string hello. Then, I'm going to log this variable. This is pretty basic, but it's very difficult to control. This is a problem with JavaScript. It's a very relaxed language and is not strict at all. You could just turn on strict mode, but that only does so much. Right after we define this variable, we can change the value of it to something like the number 5. In this example, that's fine and all, but it becomes a problem when you're working with larger applications. Throughout this course, We'll be loading hundreds of JavaScript variables, and you'll find yourself needing more control than usual. I'm going to run the command node index. You'll see that the number 5 is being outputted. This is the expected behavior so far. With ES6, there are two additional ways to create variables which are constants and let. Let's explore what those are. Before I do, I want to highlight that constants and let variables don't replace the var keyword. Even though there are different ways to define variables, it's not like those methods are completely replacing the var keyword. Using the var keyword is still valid JavaScript code and will continue to be supported for many years. I just wanted you to be aware of that. Alright, let's start things off by learning about the const keyword. The keyword const is short for constant. Constants allow you to create variables that never change. They can never be changed after being defined. If you try to change the value of a constant, then you'll be given an error and the value would still stay the same. Using a constant is fairly easy. All you have to do is change the keyword from var to const. That's all you have to do. Everything else is still the same. You can set the constant to any kind of value you want. It can be a string, number, array, and even an object. I'm going to clear my console. Input the command cls, which is short for clear the screen. This will remove any previous commands while still keeping you in the same directory. It's really useful when your command line starts to become cluttered. 
You'll see me use it often, so just be aware of that. Anyway, let's test this out by running the command node index. After running this command, we'll get an error. The error is telling us that you can't change the value of a constant, which is what we're doing in our code. I'm going to comment out this line and then run the command again. After running it, We'll see no errors and the constant is working as expected. Throughout this course, you'll see me using constants a lot. Actually, if you were to view any tutorials or look at other people's code, then you'll notice that constants are widely adopted. You'll definitely get a lot of practice using constants and you'll be fairly confident using them. By using constants, we assure ourselves that we have more control over how our variables are set. Let's move on to the next way of creating variables. Along with constants, you can also create block scope level variables. That's a big phrase. Let me break down what that means. ES6 introduces the keyword let. Let is another way of creating variables. I'm going to create a variable named bar and assign its value to 10. Using let is as simple as changing the keyword from var to let. Just like last time, you can create any kind of variable you want. You can use let for strings, numbers, arrays, objects, etc. I'm going to log the bar variable and then I'm going to run the script through Node. As expected, we'll see the number 10 outputted. At this point, we've confirmed that let works and we can create any kind of variable we want. Next, I'm going to create a conditional statement. This conditional statement will always be true. I'm not too concerned about what the condition is. Inside this conditional statement, I'm going to reassign the bar variable to 5. Lastly, I'll run the command again. We should get no errors, and as expected, we'll see the number 5 instead of 10. So what exactly does let do? I'll show you first, and then I'll explain. I'm going to move my bar variable definition inside my conditional statement, like so. Let's try running the command one more time and see what we get. You'll receive an error stating that the bar is undefined. This can seem strange at first, but it's not once you understand what's going on. Let makes it so only code that is on the same level as words defined can change it. In this example, we define the bar variable inside this block statement. Only code inside this block statement can access and change the variable bar. Once this block statement is finished running, then the bar variable is destroyed. This means we can't access it outside this block statement like we do in this log function. Previously, everything was working fine when the variable was defined outside this block statement. That's because the variable is available globally. This is the power of let variables. You can control how far a variable can be controlled. In a way, it adds an extra layer of security. If you were to use the keywords const or let, then this script would work fine. I'm going to change the keyword from let to var. This code should now work. Run the command node index. This will run the script, and as expected, there are no errors. I'm going to move the bar variable back to the global scope and get rid of this conditional statement. That's basically it for variables. This is just the basics of these two keywords. You'll find that both of these keywords are used in a lot of design patterns for their benefits. We'll get a lot of practice using these, so don't worry if you don't fully understand these concepts. In the next lecture, we'll talk about arrow functions, which is another new feature in ES6. ES6 comes with a new way of creating functions, which are called arrow functions. Before we get started, I'm going to comment out any code inside the index file. I'm now going to create a function called hello, and all it will do is console.log a message. Let's keep it simple and set the message to hello world. Lastly, I'm going to call this function. 
this is just a regular function. I'm going to run the node index command. As expected, this will just output the message. Nothing really new so far. ES6 introduces a new way to define functions called arrow functions. The syntax can be a bit confusing at first, but it's definitely more readable once you understand what's going on. To create an arrow function, you need to do the following. First, you don't need to use the function keyword so you can safely remove it. Next, you have to remove the name of the function. Then you need to add the following symbols after parentheses. Equals greater than. This is what JavaScript calls a fat arrow. Lastly, you can remove these curly braces and move the message on the same line. This is a very basic example of an arrow function. It's a shorter way of writing a function. Right off the bat, arrow functions are completely anonymous. You cannot just write an arrow function by itself. You either have to assign it to a variable or pass it into another function that will use it. If you were to add the name of the function right before the parentheses, you will receive an error. Let's first learn how to assign it to a variable. I'm going to create a variable called hello. The value of this variable will be assigned to the arrow function like so. And just like that, the arrow function is now usable. I can run the node index command again and you'll see the message just like before. Let's do a side by side comparison. I'm going to add a comment above indicating that this is an arrow function. Then I'm going to create a normal function like the one we had before. These two functions do the exact same thing and are completely identical as far as functionality goes. The only noticeable difference is the way they're written. Unlike arrow functions, regular functions are usually multi-lined even if you have one line of code. Of course, you can always move everything to be one line of code. However, the code becomes less readable. The arrow function is much more readable and shorter to write. I'm going to come without the regular function. Let's keep working with the arrow function. Arrow functions can be multi-line. To make a multi-line arrow function, you can just add in the curly brackets. The curly brackets are completely optional if you only have one line of code, but required if you want to have multiple lines. Throughout this course, I'll be using curly brackets regardless of how many lines a function has. I add it for readability. If you want to, you can do the same. You won't face any performance issues. It's all preference. And just like any other function, we can also have parameters. I'm going to create a parameter called param1. To have multiple parameters, you can just add a comma to separate each parameter. For now, I only want one parameter. I'm going to update the code where I call the hello function and pass in a message. We'll use the hello world message we had before. I want to use this parameter, so I will place the static message with the message we're passed in. With that all set, I'm going to run the node index command. The script should work as expected, where the message is being outputted onto the console. Arrow functions work the same way as functions, but are written differently. There are two things you should be aware of when using arrow functions. The first thing is that the parentheses are optional if you only have one parameter. In this example, we only have one parameter and so we can just remove the parentheses from this line of code. This is completely valid and allowed. However, this option is only available if you have one parameter. For example, if an arrow function has zero parameters, then you're required to have parentheses. If you have one parameter, then you have the option of using parentheses. If you have two or more parameters, then you're required to have parentheses. I'm going to add my parentheses back even though we only have one parameter. This right here is preference. Throughout this course, I will continue using parentheses even if my arrow functions only have one parameter. It just makes things more consistent in my opinion. 
The second thing you need to be aware of is that arrow functions do not have a scope. Let me show you what I mean. Right below this bit of code, I'm going to create an object called foo. This object will have two properties. The first will be prop1, which will be set to 10. The second property will be prop2, which will be a regular function that logs prop1. There are two ways to reference prop1. I can use the foo variable and then access its property, or I can use the this keyword. The this keyword is the most commonly used method. I prefer to use the this keyword, so input that. Once we have that set up, I'm going to call the foo.prop2 function right afterwards. Now I'm going to run the node index command and I should see the number 10 outputted. Now let's take a look at what happens when we use an arrow function. I'm going to remove the function keyword and I'm going to add my fat arrow. Lastly, I'm going to run the command again and see what we get. Node will not throw an error, but instead output undefined. Arrow functions don't really have a scope. This means that the disk keyword doesn't really exist. What JavaScript will do is look up one level and see if that property exists. If we want to output prop1, then we would have to change the disk keyword to foo. Then we can run the command again, and we should see the number being outputted again. That's about all there is to it. Arrow functions are popular for two reasons. The first reason is that it's easier to read and write than regular functions. The second reason is that the scope becomes less of a problem. You've probably written a fair amount of JavaScript. You may have run across a problem of using nested functions. With nested functions, you would create variables that would reference the this keyword for each level. By using arrow functions, you don't have to do such a thing. All functions will share a scope which will result in writing less code. Since arrow functions have no scope, it becomes easier to understand where variables are coming from. I know it may not seem like a big deal, but it really does matter when we begin writing bigger applications. You'll get plenty of practice using arrow functions and better understand their uses throughout this course. I'm back on the Node.js site and I want to talk about this one thing we skipped over. The part where the description says non-blocking I.O. model. The reason I skipped it is because it's a very important concept to understand, so it deserved a lecture of its own. Let's start things off with an example. Currently, I'm still working inside the index.js file, but I've emptied it out. Feel free to do the same. First, let's explore what synchronous code looks like. Right below, I'm going to add a series of console.log messages. About four should do it. Here is what they'll say. Hi, I am Boop. Hear me beep. Bye. This is a very straightforward example. You already have an idea of what the output would look like. One by one, Node will execute this code in the order we've written it. So let's run the command node index and see the output. In the console, we will see hi, I am boop, hear me beep, bye. This is what's called synchronous code. It's code that runs line by line one at a time. Before the bye message is logged, the hear me beep message is logged. Before the hear me beep message is logged, then the I am boop message has to be logged. Lastly, before the I am boop message is logged, the high message has to be logged. This code is blocking the next line from running. Blocking isn't bad, but it can lead to performance issues. In most languages, blocking is very common. Let's take a look at a visual example of what's going on internally. So here I have a visual representation of what's going on internally. Let's run the script. The first line is the high message, which takes about one second to run. I'm exaggerating the numbers here. In reality, logging a message takes a fraction of a millisecond to run, and there's very little resources being used. Just go with me here for the sake of simplicity. 
So this one line takes one second to run. After it's finished running, the second line will run, which is the I am boot message. This also takes a second to run. After that, the next line runs, which is the hear me beep message. However, let's say that in order to output this message, our application has to query a database. Grabbing this information takes a little longer than all the other lines. In the end, it takes 3 seconds to run. The next line cannot run until this line is finished running. Once this line is finished running, the last message by is outputted, which takes 1 second. In total, this took 6 seconds to run. Obviously, this is way too long for any application, but let's keep it simple. This way of writing code is synchronous and blocking. In this example, you'll notice that each line is independent. For example, nothing from the second line depends on the one above it and vice versa. We could rearrange this and the code would still work. Since this line that queries the database takes longer and doesn't depend on any other code to work, then we should make it work in the background. So here's what we'll do. Back inside the script, I'm going to call the function setTimeout right after the imboot message. This function doesn't query a database, but we'll use it to simply simulate the behavior of querying the database. I'm going to set the second parameter to 3000 to make it run for 3 seconds. Then I'll just cut and paste the hear me beep message into this function. Let's run the command node index and you'll see the three messages pop up. Because we are running the set timeout function, the code inside it will not run until 3 seconds have passed. Once those 3 seconds have passed, you should see the hear me beep message appear. Even though we called the set timeout function before the buy message, the buy message was outputted before the function. Let's look at the visual example again, except with the newer version. I'll run the script and once again, we'll see the hello I am boop message run. They both take one second. Then, right after those, the set timeout function runs. This will take three seconds to run, however, because it has a callback function, node will run it in the background. This makes this bit of code non-blocking. Rather than wait for this function to run, the next bit of code will be allowed to run, which is the buy message. Eventually, after 3 seconds, the hear me beep message will be logged and the script will finish running. In total, this takes 5 seconds to run. This is what's considered non-blocking or asynchronous. The fact that the rest of the code can run without having to worry about the other task is great. This increases performance and speed. This introduces a new style of programming to most people. Usually, you would write your code line by line in the order you want it to run. However, we'll be writing code that runs parallel to each other. This can get confusing and messy fast. Let me show you a basic example. Inside the script, I'm going to copy this timeout and just paste it in about two more times inside itself. You should be familiar with JavaScript, so seeing something like this is normal. This nested code really looks sloppy and it gets harder to read the deeper we go. I'm going to undo this. Luckily, Node adopts the latest features of JavaScript, so things like promises and the sync await will make this look cleaner. But let's get back to what we read previously. On the Node homepage, you'll see that this becomes more clear. The non-blocking I.O. model that's being referred here is the ability to write code that doesn't block other code from running. Now that we understand what that looks like code-wise, let's look at what Node is doing internally. The last visual example I showed you just simulated how the code ran. In this example, I'll show you what's going on behind the scenes. So here, we have three things called the stack, callback queue, and background task. The background task tends to have different names. Sometimes you'll hear it referred to as the heap, but we'll keep the name as is for now. This example is an oversimplification of what's going on. All three of these work together to make Node work. The stack is where it usually all starts. The stack is what Node uses to run code line by line. Basically, Node will load our script into the stack. 
The first line is what gets put into the stack first, followed by the second line, third line, so on and so forth. Once the code is loaded, Node will begin going through it one by one. When you add code to the stack, it gets placed at the bottom. Code placed at the bottom gets executed first. Something important to understand is that you can't remove something from the stack unless the code above the item you want to remove is also removed. So this first line here can't be removed unless the other three lines of code above it are removed. You can think of it like a can of balls. You can put some balls in the can, but if you want to remove the one on the bottom, you have to remove the one on top first. So let's go through this. The first line will run the second, and then the third. This third line is special though. Node will recognize that this code will run at a later time. So, it will put it inside the background task while it's running. Then Node will continue to clear the stack. Eventually, the stack will get empty, and Node will want to end the process. However, it'll check to see if anything is happening in either the background task or the callback queue. This is why you saw the command line pause for a moment. Even though all code was finished executing, it recognized that there were still some tasks that haven't finished yet. During this time, Node will continuously check the callback queue. This is why you see these arrows representing a constant cycle. If there's any code inside the callback queue, then that code gets put into the stack. This only happens when the current stack is finished running. Right now, there is nothing in the callback queue, so nothing will run in the stack. Eventually, after 3 seconds, the code in the background task will be finished running. The code inside this callback function will get put into the callback queue. Node will be able to pick up that there is code inside the callback queue and push it onto the stack. Once there is code in the stack, then that will get executed. After that, everything will be empty and Node will end the process right then and there. Most people tend to get confused by this because you actually don't control most of this. It's kind of hard to understand if you don't ever have to write the code to manage it. It's okay if you don't understand fully as we'll be writing code that adheres to this process. This is just to give you an idea of what's going on. Anyway, that's all there is to it. In the next couple of lectures, we'll get back to writing code, so I'll see you there. In the past few lectures, we've been adding all our code into one file. For the most part, it really wasn't hard to manage, but it isn't practical. When working on actual projects, you will find yourself needing to split your code into multiple files. Node provides an easy way to do this called modules. A module is a file or group of files that you can include into your project. There are three types of modules you'll find yourself working with. Modules that you create, modules that other developers create, and modules that come provided with Node. We'll be exploring all three of these throughout this course. Let's get started with creating our own module. Right now, I'm inside a new directory. I want you to create a new one as well. Name it whatever you want and point your editor and command line to it. To get started, I'm going to create two files called index.js and functions.js. The index.js file is what we'll consider the entry point. An entry point is basically the first file that runs. As you may know, you can only run one file when using the node command. This first file that initializes everything and takes care of loading all other files for you. To us, it'll just be a JavaScript file, but you'll usually hear the word entry point to describe the first file in the process. The functions file will contain the code that we'll want to include inside the index file. I'm going to leave the functions file empty for now and just work inside the index file. To include a file, you need to use a function called require. You don't need to do anything to make sure this function is available to you. This is automatically defined and provided to you by Node. All we have to pass in is the path to the file we want to include. To start things off, I'm going to pass in a dot forward slash. This is very important when including files. 
By passing this in, you're telling Node that the files you want to include are relative to this file's directory. Then you follow this up with the name of the file, which is functions.js. Just like that, we've now loaded a file inside this file. However, we can't stop there. There are two things I need to highlight. First, you actually don't need to include the JavaScript extension like I'm doing here. Node will automatically assume you want to load JavaScript files and will add the extension for you if you don't provide one. So, we can just remove this. I'll be excluding the extension from now on for the rest of this course. The second is that we're not actually loading the file. What Node does is return the data from that file. That may seem strange at first, so let me show you by example. Inside the functions file, create a variable named foo and set its value to 5. Then inside the index file, console.log the foo variable. At first glance, this may seem like it'll work because we're including the functions file, which should also load the foo variable. Let's try running this file and see what happens. Inside the command line, make sure you're inside the same directory as these files. Once you've confirmed that, run the command node index. Right after running this, we'll get an error. It's telling us that foo is undefined. This is because Node does not make variables to find inside other files available for you to use inside the file you loaded them in. I'm going to comment this out for a moment so we don't get this error. Let's wrap this require function with the console.log function. I want to see what exactly is being returned when we call this function. After doing so, run the command node index and see what we get. What gets outputted onto the screen is an empty object. The reason we get an object is because Node is returning the data from that file. It's not loading that file. The data returned depends on us, the developers of the application. Since we're being returned data, it's best practice to actually store that data. We could just constantly use the require function, but that can hurt the performance of our script. So, we can actually store that data inside a variable. I'll remove this console.log statement since we don't need it anymore. I'm going to create a constant named functions and assign it to this require function. When creating variables that store the data returned by a file, it's usually stored inside a constant. When it comes to modules, you usually expect the data to be ready for you, so there's no need to change it. I'm not saying that you should always use constants, but if you don't plan on changing the data inside, then it's a good idea to use a constant. Another thing I want to note down is that I'm naming my variable with the same name as the file. This is also common practice. You can name your variables whatever you want, but developers tend to name it the same name as the file name to avoid confusion. Sometimes you'll find yourself using modules with the same name and so you'll have to get creative with the name. This is a simple example, so we don't need to do that. Below this, I'm going to create a const.log statement. Instead of logging the require function, I'm going to log the function's variable. With that all set, I'm going to run the script again and use the node index command. This should provide the same result as the last time, which is outputting an empty object. So we're now properly storing the data, but how do we determine what data gets returned? Well, that's easily done using something called exports. Inside the functions file, I'm going to input the following, module.exports equals foo. I'm introducing something new here called the module object. I promise I'll talk more about this object in just a moment, but let's see if this works. Inside the command line, run the node index command again. This time we'll get the number 5 outputted instead of an empty object, so what exactly is going on and why? Well, let's start with the module object first. Node considers every JavaScript file to be a module. This also includes the entry point file, which is the index.js file. Since every file is a module, then Node will create a variable named module that is unique to each file. 
This variable is an object that contains properties related to the file it's being used in. Let's actually check this out. At the end of both files, I'm going to console.log the module object. I'm also going to comment out any other logs so we can focus solely on this object. With that all set, let's try running the node index command again. After running this, we get two objects being outputted onto the screen. There's a lot of data here, so let's go through it together. These two objects will have similar properties to find, but the values for each will be different. To tell which object belongs to which file, you'll have to search for one of two properties. Each module object will define a file name and ID. This will contain the path to the file this module belongs to. After looking at this, you'll see that the function's module is loaded first and then the index module. This makes sense since the function's file will run first before we log the module object from the index file. Now that we know which module object belongs to which file, let's take a closer look at the function's object first. The first thing I want to highlight is this parent property. This will contain a list of modules that loaded this file. This is great because it gives us the opportunity to trace back the files if we ever need to. Likewise, if you scroll down to the index module, you'll see that the parent property is null. This is because this is the entry point file, so there shouldn't be any parent data for this file. However, we do get this property named children, which will contain a list of modules that this module requires. Scrolling back up, you'll see that the children property is an empty array for the function's file. Children modules are allowed to load more modules. This is completely allowed and common. You can go as deep as you want without a problem. Anyway, for the most part, we never want to change any of these values. 99% of the time, you'll never have to modify or use these values. Most of the time, it's for Node to use internally. All of this is set up for you so you don't have to worry about it. The most important property is the export property. Taking a closer look, you'll see that the value for the export property of the function's module is 5. This is the value we set it to inside our code. Unlike these other properties, you're allowed to freely set the export property to whatever you want. This can be an object, function, string, numbers, and even Boolean values. There's no limits here. So here's what's going on when we run our code. Node will run the index file line by line. It'll notice that you want to load data from a file. You specify that file inside this function. Node will then begin running the function's file line by line. Once this is finished, it'll then look inside the export property of the module object and return whatever is inside. This is why, when you log the function's variable, you get the number 5. Since the value of the export property is 5, then that's what's returned. If you look inside the function's module object, you'll see the export property is set to 5. Then, if you look inside the index module, you'll see that it's an empty object. By default, Node will make every export property an empty object unless you override it. I'm going to comment out the statements that log the module object in both files. Then I'm going to uncomment the logging of the functions variable in the index file. So that's modules in a nutshell. You're not loading a file, and you're telling Node to run it, and then whatever is inside the exports property is what's returned. This is great because you can have the same variable names in different files without having to worry about naming conflicts. This also allows for a lot of design patterns for your applications. Now that we understand how modules work, in the next lecture, we'll explore how to use modules from Node and the community. Throughout this course, we'll be working with a lot of modules provided by the community and Node itself. Most of these modules will handle the heavy lifting so we can focus more on our projects. Before we get to that, let's explore how to use them. First up are the modules provided by Node. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to the official Node.js documentation. Here you'll find a list of some of the modules available to you. There's a little over 20 available. 
These modules are all low level and mostly work with the system. You've probably heard that phrase before. Low level is used to describe something that doesn't control a lot of the functionality for you. Therefore, you have to specify a lot of the data and commands to interact with your system. Let me show you an example. One of the modules Node provides is called File System. This module allows you to read, write, update, and delete files. Basically, any file operations can be done through this module. I'm going to search for something called fs.write. This is a function that will write data to a file. As you can see, there's more to this than just the data you want to add. You have to provide stuff like the buffer, offsets, length, and more. As a beginner, a lot of these modules can be overwhelming. Luckily, the community provides modules that build on top of these so you can focus more on your actual project. Let's explore how to use one of these node modules and then look at third-party modules. Right now, I'm inside a new directory with a file called index.js. If you want to save some time, you can just use the same files you had before and empty them out or comment them out. I'm going to create a variable called util and set it to the required function. The module I want to use is called util. This is one of the more simpler node modules available. You'll notice that I don't include the dot forward slash. This is because this is a global module. Global modules are modules that are available everywhere on your system. Node will be able to pick up on this and automatically take care of loading the correct module. By default, all the modules that come bundled with Node are global. You have the ability to add more global modules, but we'll get to that soon. Let's go back to the documentation and check out this module. This module basically provides some functions for formatting your data. Nothing really complex. A lot of this can be helpful for debugging your code. Let's begin using this module. I'm going to console.log some text. However, I want to format that text. I'm going to use the util module and call the format function. Most modules return an object, and most of these objects contain functions. The format function will take in the string you want to format. I'm going to set this to hello percent %s. The percent %s is what's called a placeholder. Basically, this will be replaced with the text you pass in to the second parameter. In this case, I'm going to set the second parameter to world. With that all set, Let's run the command node index. We should see the message hello world. This is a very straightforward function for making your strings dynamic. I know it isn't anything groundbreaking, but this should give you an idea on how to use node modules. Going back to the documentation, you'll find that the format function has different placeholders for different types of data. There's also plenty of examples here on how to use this function, so why don't you play around with this function a bit? So that's how you use node modules. The last kind of modules you'll find yourself using are modules provided by the community. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to the NPM site. We briefly went over what this is. It's a site where you can find modules uploaded by the community. I'm going to search for a module called Happy. This is a module that allows you to create a web server and provides a lot of tools for authentication, routing, and so much more. We'll explore those topics later on, but let's explore this page a little more. On the sidebar, you'll find some statistics, additional information about this module, and the collaborators. At the top of this, you'll find a command to install this module. We could just download this module, but that brings more problems than it solves. Back inside the editor, I'm going to input the command npm install happy. There are a couple of things going on here. When you installed Node, the npm command was also made available. The purpose of the npm command is to make it easy to communicate with the npm site and install modules. Then we have this install command. This is what's called a subcommand. 
subcommands are a way to group commands together. If we just type install, then we would end up confusing the program. As you can imagine, the keyword install is a pretty generic word. If all programs use generic words like this, then that would cause conflicting problems. To solve this, subcommands were introduced. Rather than trying to come up with unique names for your commands, you can just use one unique name and then all the other commands can be generic. This command will allow us to download and install a module from npm. The module that's downloaded will depend on what you pass in after this command. It's just the name of the module you'd like to use. In this case, it would be happy. Let's run this command now. This may take a while for some of you as it's being downloaded and prepared for you. Once that's finished downloading, you will see a new directory created called Node Modules. When you install modules from npm, they will be placed inside this directory. Let's open up this directory and see what's inside. Immediately, you will find various folders here. These are all modules. At first glance, it may seem strange because we only installed one module. But npm installed its dependencies. A dependency is a module that is required from another module to work. This is one of the main reasons you'll want to use npm. A lot of modules require other modules to work. That's perfectly normal. The problem with this is that you would have to download all these modules too. If those modules also have their own dependencies, then you would have to download those too. You would have to continuously download modules to make sure everything works. npm solves this problem by handling it for you. By running this command, all these modules were installed along with their dependencies. Not only did it download those dependencies, but it also took care of comparing versions between modules. Some modules will require the same module, but they could be two different versions. npm will take care of downloading one that's compatible with both. If it can't find one, then you would receive an error. Luckily, Happy is a module that is constantly updated and checked for any compatibility issues, so you shouldn't receive any errors. We'll explore how this works more in depth, but for now, let's leave it as is. Inside your index file, you can start using the modules right away. I'm going to create a variable named happy and assign it to the value returned by the require function. The module I want to use is called happy. Once again, you don't have to pass in a dot forward slash. Node will be able to detect that there's a node modules folder and will search inside that folder for the module you want to load. It's taken care of for you automatically. That's basically it for modules. Modules give us the ability to split our code into separate files. Not only can we split our code, but we can distribute it and make it available for others to use. The npm is one of the biggest registries in the programming world. There are many modules from basic string manipulation to full-fledged frameworks. We'll be exploring some of these modules as the course progresses. We've gone over some of the fundamentals of Node. At this point, I want to jump right into developing websites. There is one last thing I want to cover before we get into that, which is understanding Node errors. We've experienced them in the past few lectures, but I never went into detail. So that's what we'll do here. We'll take the time to dissect an error provided by Node. This lecture will be relatively short, but it's still important to know nonetheless. Right now, I'm inside the code we previously worked on. I'm going to purposely generate an error by removing this parentheses from this line of code. This should throw an error. After removing this line, let's run the command node index. Immediately after running this command, we'll get an error. The first thing this error tells us is the file name where the error originated along with the line number. This is very helpful information as it'll allow us to determine where to find the error and debug it from there. Right below this, you'll find the line itself that triggered the error. Sometimes it can be multiple lines, but in this case, it's just this one single line. Sometimes Node will even point to the exact spot that error occurred. Afterwards, we'll be given a description of the error. 
errors tend to be categorized. In this case, this error falls under the syntax error category. Next to the category is the full description. Note is telling us missing parentheses after arguments list. Basically, it's saying we need to include the closing parentheses for our function. Lastly, you'll get something called a stack trace. A stack trace is a list of files and lines that eventually led to this error. In some situations, a certain line may not be the actual problem. Sometimes you'll be passing data between modules. There can be a possibility that a module doesn't pass the correct data onto the next module. This will result in the subsequent module unable to use the data, leading to an error. In this example, the stack trace is useless to us. You'll notice that there's a lot of files running here. Node will load its own files. This is something you don't have to worry about. It's not really important you understand what goes on in these files. So those are errors in a nutshell. There are better ways to handle errors, but we'll get to that eventually. For now, we'll be using the console to help us debug errors. In the next section, we'll finally start creating websites. I'll see you there. We're now going to begin creating websites. This is the most exciting part of the course. Before we dive into that, I want to take the time to talk about the stack we'll be using. This is one of the most crucial steps you'll take before writing a single line of code, and that is deciding your stack. First off, what is a stack? A stack is the framework, programming language, tools, and database you use to create your application. This also includes the third-party tools you use like Amazon S3 or Storage Host. Basically, it's anything that makes your application function the way it does. In the beginning, you'll have an idea of what you'll want your stack to look like. At any given moment, you can add on or remove parts from your stack. For example, you could switch databases or frameworks. You can even go as far as to rewriting your application because you want to use a different stack. But that would be really bad. You want to take the time to pick a good stack so you can focus more on your application. When it comes to Node, you can pick any stack you want. There are a lot of tools and frameworks built just for Node that it can be difficult to decide what to use. It is possible and allowed to keep your stack as minimal as possible. At the beginning, we will learn how to create a website using Node itself. We won't use tools or frameworks. It'll be pure Node. This is considered the hard way and the least popular method. I don't expect you to fully comprehend this method of building a website. What's more important is that you understand what's going on behind the scenes. Before you can use a framework, it's important to understand the basics. Only when you understand the basics can you fully appreciate using a framework. It can even make you a better developer. That will be the first project. After that, we'll start looking into adding on to our stack. This is where it gets tricky because there is no one stack to rule them all. Everyone has their opinions and what they prefer. The first thing you'll end up deciding is the frameworks to use. Currently, the most popular framework is Express. Express is a framework for creating websites using Node. Let's check out the Express site. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to the Express site. Express describes itself as a fast, unopinionated, minimalist web framework for Node.js. What exactly does that mean? Well, first we have to understand what type of frameworks there are. Frameworks in general provide code that help you build your site. They take care of the foundation, and from there, you build on top of it. The main difference between frameworks is how much code they provide to you out of the box. Frameworks can usually be put into one of two categories. First up is a configuration over convention framework. These frameworks provide the basic setup and then let you take it from there. Sometimes they'll provide ways to authenticate users, handle file uploads, and connect to the database. These types of frameworks let you decide what you should use in your application. Rather than making the decisions for you, you have to be the one to decide what works and what doesn't. These tend to be the most popular types of frameworks because they give you complete freedom. Not only do you get to decide what tools to use, but you also have control over your folder structure. 
and you can name your files whatever you want and organize them however you like. Another benefit is that these frameworks have a small learning curve. It only takes an hour before you can get into developing your site. There is a problem with this though. There are dozens of tools and methods for organizing your code. For a beginner, it can be overwhelming. Since there is no standard way to organize or to structure your code, you can open yourself up to scaling issues. Another problem that arises is that since there are no standards, then there's a possibility of miscommunication between teams. Most teams overcome this by creating their own standard if the framework they use doesn't come with one. Express falls under this category of framework. Despite the flaws I point out, most developers really prefer this kind of framework. It allows you to get started quickly and they're easy. I will say this though, one of the reasons Express stands at the top is because it was one of the first frameworks to come out. Express is as old as Node. Express has had time to establish itself as the most popular framework in Node. There are a lot of tutorials revolved around Express, so using Express is the safest option for getting started. There is one problem, which is that it hasn't been updated in years. Currently, Express has been in version 4 for a couple of years now. Express 5 has been in development for over 3 years now. The project is actively maintained for bugs and security fixes, but as for an update, there is no clear date when that will happen. Alternatively, there is the framework Happy. Happy is a framework that is categorized under the configuration over convention type. You decide on the structure of your app. However, it does provide support for authentication, file uploads, and much more. I would say it's second in terms of popularity. For this course, we won't be using Express. I believe it's too simplistic and a bit difficult to work with when working on larger projects. There are better frameworks out there, and I'll show you what those are in just a moment. The next type of framework is convention over configuration. They're the exact opposite of what we just talked about. These frameworks provide structure and come bundled with almost everything you need. The extent of how much is handled for you depends on the framework. The benefit of using these frameworks is that you don't have to worry about all the decisions. When you write code, you know exactly what's going to happen and when it's going to happen. By having structure, you can focus more on your application rather than having to configure everything. The disadvantage of using these kinds of frameworks is there usually is a learning curve. You also have to adjust yourself to a different kind of coding style. Let's take a look at some convention over configuration frameworks. The most popular option is Meteor. I'll provide a link to this in the resource section of this lecture. Meteor is a framework that's actually backed by investors. So, it has a huge community and a team fully dedicated to this framework. They even provide their own hosting service. While Meteor is a great framework, it won't be the framework we'll be using. The framework I prefer is something called Adonis. I'll provide a link to this in the research section of this lecture. This is the framework we'll be using for the majority of this course. The reason I prefer this framework is because it provides structure. It's easy to get into and provides a lot of tools to get started. I also find the documentation to be really useful and unlike most frameworks, it has support for SQL databases out of the box. To reiterate, we'll learn how to create a server manually, then we'll learn how to do it in Adonis. The site we build with Adonis is the one we'll dive into deeply and build an actual site with. Now that we know what a framework is, let's talk about databases. A database is a program that stores data about anything. You can use databases to store information about users or how much inventory you have in a warehouse. In our case, the database we'll be using for our stack should be something web related. There are dozens of them out there, but they usually fall into two main categories, which is SQL and no SQL. The difference between these two is the way data is stored and retrieved. Let's look at an example of what using these databases look like. As you can see, they are vastly different. Let me define SQL first. SQL stands for Structured Query Language. In order to communicate with a database, you have to input commands like you see here. 
This is what's called a query. You can think of a query as a series of commands to communicate with the database. If you take a closer look, you should see that the query does make somewhat sense. We're selecting certain data from a database where the data should be specific to a zip code. I know it doesn't make complete sense to you, and that's fine. All you need to know is that you have to type a series of commands to get the data you want. Over on the NoSQL side, you'll see that there are no queries. Instead, you're giving the database the data. Actually, you'll notice that the data is formatted like JSON. A lot of developers tend to lean towards NoSQL databases because you're basically writing JavaScript objects. However, NoSQL databases definitely have their problems. The biggest problem is relationships. I don't expect you to know what a relationship is, so let's explore it together. A relationship is a connection between two pieces of data stored separately. For example, you may have a place to store users and another place to store blog posts. And these are two different pieces of data that you would store separately. However, they can be connected because a blog post can be written by a user and the user can write a blog post. This connection right here is what's called a relationship. There are all kinds of relationships, but let's keep it simple. For most cases, you will find yourself wanting relationships. For most NoSQL databases, there is no support for relationships. Instead, you have to program that relationship. You have to take care of managing that relationship and making the connection. On the other hand, SQL databases do have support for relationships. SQL databases give the option of defining the relationships beforehand. They also provide security and checks for you by constraining your data. For this course, we'll be using an SQL database. However, there is one thing that no SQL databases have over SQL databases, and that is performance. In most benchmarks, no SQL databases perform way faster. Despite the speed, we'll be sticking with an SQL databases for their benefits. While SQL databases are slower, they actually aren't slow. Sites like Facebook, Google, and YouTube all use SQL databases for their reliability and feature set. Something I want to make clear is that you should never choose a database based on its speed. It's always good to have speed, but you give up a lot of terms and usability. And you should consider a lot of factors when adding something to your stack. Currently, the most popular NoSQL database is MongoDB. There's also other databases such as Redis or CouchDB. There are more NoSQL databases than there are SQL databases. With that being said, there are quite a few good SQL databases available, but the one we'll be using is called MySQL or MariaDB. This is one of the most popular databases around that is used by companies like Facebook, Google, and Microsoft. It's been battle tested and can scale easily. There is actually another alternative called MariaDB. MariaDB is built on top of MySQL and is being built in a different direction. I won't dive too much into this because it's not worth going over. All you need to know is that everything we write will be compatible with both so you can change between both at any time. So that's our stack, Adonis and MySQL slash MariaDB. We'll be adding onto the stack as the course progresses, but we'll get to that later. The last thing I want to say is that this stack is my preferred stack. Everyone has their opinions, and this is just mine. I find this to be the easiest way to create sites using Node while providing me with many options. I encourage you to explore your options and see what looks appealing to you. Hopefully you'll like what I show you and continue to use it. If you decide it's not for you, then that's fine. A lot of this will still be Node.js, so you don't have to worry about much when changing frameworks. As promised, we will start off with learning how to create a server manually. Before we get to that, it's important to understand a few concepts that make servers work. Computers naturally can't communicate with one another. You can think of computers as people who speak different languages. To get around this, developers have created something called a protocol. A protocol is a set of rules on how two different systems communicate with each other. Since we're creating websites, this would be the client, a user's browser, and the server 
the place where we store our files. Both of these are expecting certain information in a certain format. This is what's called a protocol. There are various protocols available. There's HTTP, which is used for the web. Then there's FTP for transferring files. And then there's SMTP for sending and receiving emails. Let's focus on HTTP. HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. Quite a few big words here, so let's break it down. Hypertext is a document that contains links to other texts. Let's think about a plain document for a second. A TXT file is considered plain text. There's nothing special about it. It's just text that gets displayed as is. When it comes to HTML, we need a little more than just plain text. This is where hypertext comes into place. Unlike regular files, hypertext files contain text that allows for formatting and embedding capabilities for images, video, and audio files. Combine this with transfer and protocol, and you'll see that HTTP is a set of rules for transferring hypertext files. That's a very simplistic explanation. There's more to it than this, but that's all you really need to know right now. Along with HTTP, we also need to know what ports are. You can think of a port as a door to a house. However, unlike real houses, computers can have thousands of ports. The reason for having so many doors is because there are dozens of applications that can use any of these ports at any given moment. You may have a couple of programs open up on your computer right now. When you're sending and receiving data, your computer does not know what data belongs to which program. With the help of ports, this becomes easier to manage. A program will usually assign itself to a port that will listen for incoming data. For the most part, operating systems will usually take up the first 1000 ports, so I don't recommend ever using those. You'll see how we can take up a port in just a moment, but let's keep in mind that you can use almost any port you want just as long as another program isn't using it. This is why most tutorials recommend using port 8080, 8888, or 3000. They're not picking them for any specific reason. It's just that most of the time, these ports aren't taken up by other programs. There is one exception to this, and that's port 80. Let me show you what I mean. Right now, I have a website opened up called milk.com. It's a pretty basic website. Inside the address bar, I'm going to try and access a port. To access a port, you simply type in a colon after the domain extension and then pass in the port number. I'll use the port number 3000. After inputting this, I'll receive an error saying that the connection was refused. This usually means there is no program listening to this port. By default, most sites use port 80. If I were to change this to port 80, you'll see that Chrome will remove this port. This is because that's the port websites use. During development, we'll be using a high port number like 3000 just so we don't run into any problems. However, when you upload your code to a server, then that port is usually available, so be sure to update your code to use port 80. Alright, that does it for now. These are really oversimplified explanations, but you don't need to be a complete expert on these subjects. I just wanted to give you a general overview so you can better understand the code we write. Hello world, wake me up to another good, good morning, time to go. Oh, we are all looking for adventure. We are all looking for adventure. It's time to finally create a web server using Node. Node provides a few low-level APIs to get this working. We're responsible for setting up the server along with handling the port and requests. Initially, this will take a few lines of code, but you will quickly realize how difficult it can be to scale as we add on to it. 
I want you to keep in mind that this is the hard way of doing things. Most developers don't manually create a server. It's more common to use frameworks, so don't worry if you don't completely understand every line of code presented here. It's more important that you understand the idea of what's going on. This way you can appreciate and understand frameworks a whole lot more. Alright, to get started, I'm going to create a file named app.js. You can name this whatever you want. Most developers use server.js or index.js. Whatever you prefer is fine. I'm creating this file inside an empty directory, so make sure you're inside a new directory as well and have your command line pointed to it. I'll be using the one that comes with my editor. I'm going to create a constant named HTTP and call the require function for the HTTP module. Once again, it's common practice to name your variables after the module. You can name it whatever you want, but for simplicity, you generally want to use the module name. This module that we're loading is bundled with Node, so you don't need to do anything to make sure it's available to you. This module will help you create a web server and even cover some of the basics for you. With this module loaded, we can call a method right afterwards called create server. As you may have guessed, this will help set up a server. Inside this method, you need to pass in a function. I'm going to use an arrow function for this. This will be a callback function that will be called whenever we receive a request. There are two parameters here, which are the request and response. You can name these whatever you want, but most developers just use the shorthand version. The request will contain information about the request itself. Things like the IP, URL, queries, and anything else that's sent over. This information is provided by the client. The response will provide properties and methods for our response. We are responsible for how we will handle this response. We can send back a number of things like an HTML file, image, JSON, and even nothing. If we send back nothing, then the user will actually see a loading screen. Eventually, the browser will no longer wait and give them a timeout error. That really isn't user-friendly, so let's give them something back. One of the methods of the response object is the write function, so let's call that inside this callback function. In most cases, you need to set headers and other data, but we're going to ignore that for now. We'll let Node decide what's best and just output the data right away. I'm going to pass in the string, hello world. We can't stop here though. If we were to just leave the code like this, then the user will still be waiting. We have to tell Node that we're done here and that it can close the request. So right after this, we can call the end method. If we didn't add this line, then the user will still be waiting for the response which can lead to another timeout error. The very last step to all of this is to have the server listen to a port. The code we just wrote only just sets up the server and prepares it for requests. We have to tell the server that it needs to listen for requests by chaining the listen method after this. This will have two parameters, but only the first one is required. You simply have to pass in the port number. In the previous lecture, we talked about ports. The port you pass in should be one that isn't being used. I'll set this to 3000. The second parameter is the callback function. I'll pass in an error function, and inside it, I'll simply console.log a message that says server started. This will only run once when the server has started listening for requests. This is the minimum requirement for creating a web server. Let's test to see if things work. Inside the command line, input the command node app. Right after inputting this command, you'll see the message server started. You should receive no errors indicating that everything works. This message only gets outputted if the server was successfully created and it's listening for requests. Let's check this out in our browser and see if everything is working. Inside the browser, 
input localhost colon 3000. Whenever you create servers on your computer and you're trying to access it from that same computer, then you can access it by typing in localhost. Since we did not use port 80, we have to specify the port as the browser will not detect it for us. Upon entering this page, you'll see the message hello world. When we sent this request, Node will run the function we passed into the create server method. This function did two things. First, it sent the message and then it closed the response indicating that there's nothing left for the server to send back to the clients. Alright, that's it. That's the basics of creating a server. In the next few lectures, we'll keep working with this. I'll see you there. Right now, the server we have is pretty basic. It doesn't do much but display the same thing to the user every time. In order to change the response depending on the URL, we have to do something called routing. Routing is where you handle a request and response differently depending on the URL the user submitted. When you learned HTML, you were most likely taught that you could place your files anywhere in your system. Then, you could just open them in your browser by inputting the path. To move your HTML files from your system to a live server, then you probably had to place them inside a specific folder like public, www, web, etc. Then, you could just access those files by inputting the domain followed by the file name or directory to that file. You didn't really have to worry about what's going on behind the scenes. The server took the time to figure out the connection between the URL inputted and the actual location on the system. When it comes to Node.js, this process is not handled for you at all. You have to set up the URLs and determine what gets served to the user. This is what's called routing. I'm actually oversimplifying this term. There's a whole lot more to it than what I just said, but we'll get to that later. Right now, Let's just focus on handling the request. The first step to set up routing is by figuring out the URL the user inputted. Inside this function, I'm going to console.log the request object. The URL is stored inside a property called URL, so we'll access that like so. Let's see the result of this. Inside the console, input the command node app and you should see the usual server started message with no errors. Then inside your browser, navigate to localhost 3000. Like before, we should see the message hello world. Nothing really changes, but let's go back to the terminal. You'll see that two things were outputted. The URL we requested and another request for a file called fave icon. You may or may not get this depending on your browser and system. Basically, browsers will automatically make a request for this file regardless if you specify it in your request or not. You can safely ignore it as it's not really important to us at this moment. By default, if you make a request to a domain, then the default URL would be a forward slash in node. This is what's called an endpoint. An endpoint is the part of the URL that's after the domain and port. Node provides us with just the endpoint, which is why you don't see localhost 3000 right before this. Let's keep playing around with this. Back inside the browser, I'm going to add on to the path. You can input whatever you want, but I'll keep it simple and pass in slash about. On the page, the response will be the same. That's to be expected since the function will always output the same message no matter what URL you input. Back inside the console, you should see that node logged the slash about URL after we made that request. Now that we know how URLs are grabbed, we can begin changing the response depending on the request. I'm going to comment out the code we currently have. Right below this, I'm going to create a conditional statement. All I'm going to check is if the request that URL is equal to forward slash. It's as simple as that. Now any code inside the statement will only execute for this particular request. This is how routing is done in its most basic form. Before we proceed, I'm going to set up an else statement right after this. 
we can't account for all routes, so we'll need to set up a default message for the user. Usually, this will be considered the 404 page you see when a page can't be found. Inside the else statement, I'm going to use the response object and use the function write head. Inside this function, I'll pass in a status of 404. Let's stop here for a moment and talk about headers and status messages. Every response and request has something called a body and header. The concept is very similar to HTML, where you add head and body tags to your document. The head tag is where you specify information about the page and load files. This is the code that visitors don't see. Instead, the information is for the browser to better understand your page. Anything inside the body tag is what gets rendered on the page and is viewable to the user. Basically, this idea of separating information in different parts is also applied to request and response. When a server receives a request, it will look at the header to learn more information about it. This can be almost anything from a user's IP to the browser they're using. Most information that you find in the header is just info about the request. Then there's the body of the request. The body will usually contain information that the server will process and use. In most scenarios, this can be info inputted into form fields or file uploads. For the most part, a lot of this is handled for you as either Node or the browser will provide some default values if you don't provide any. In our example, we're letting Node and the browser handle a lot for us. Throughout this course, you'll get plenty of practice with working with the header and body. For now, all we need to change is the status code. A status code is a number that lets the client know whether a request was successful or not. Status codes can be put into five categories, which are the following. A status code, starting with the number one, usually indicates information about the current request. Most servers and browsers will ignore this type of status code, and it's not recommended that you use these types of status codes. For the most part, you never have to worry about using a status code starting with the number one. The next one would be status codes starting with two. These are status codes that mean the request and response was a success. Everything worked out as planned and nothing went wrong. By default, Node will set the status code to the number 200. You don't have to do anything to set that up. After this are status codes starting with 3, indicating a redirection. You may end up using the status code just in case the user is trying to view a page they shouldn't be. Most browsers will actually handle the redirection for you if you send a status code starting with the number 3, assuming you provide a redirect URL. Up next are status codes starting with 4. These indicate that there was an error and it lies within the client. You may be familiar with the famous status code 404. 404 means that the page the user was looking for does not exist. Lastly, we have the status codes starting with 5. These indicate that there was an error on the server. Basically, during the process of the request, there was an error in your code and something unexpected happened. There are dozens of status codes available and it would be pretty overwhelming to memorize them all. Don't concern yourself too much about status codes. At the end of the day, a lot of developers mostly deal with 2-5 to five status codes during their project. Covering all scenarios are completely optional. In the resource section of this lecture, I provide a link to a page that describes the various status codes in greater detail. I suggest bookmarking it for future use. Back inside the script, you should now have a better understanding of what this line does. All we're doing is providing additional information to the browser to let them know about the request. We're basically telling the browser that the URL they're looking for doesn't exist. Right after this, I'm going to call the res.end function to end the request. Then, inside the first conditional, I'm going to use the res.write function with the message of homepage and close the response afterwards too. Just to test this even more, I'll create another else if statement to check if the user makes a request for an about page like so.
This time I'll write the message about page and end the response for it as well. Alright, that's all done. Inside the console I'm going to control C to end the current process. This will shut down the server. We do this because our code does not get refreshed whenever we make changes. This forces us to restart the server. There are ways to get around this, but we'll explore those options later. For now, input the command note app again to boot the server. You should see the server started message indicating that everything works as expected. We can now refresh the page and you should see the home page message appear. This is great because it lets us know that our routing is working correctly. Open up the developer tools and switch to the network tab. The network tab provides information about any request a page makes. If you refresh the page, you should see the request made to the site appears here. You'll notice that Chrome provides the status code the server sent back to us, which was 200. No took care of setting the value for us even though we didn't set it. You can click on this request and you'll find all the header information about the request and response. A lot of this was taken care of for you by both the browser and the server. We'll explore this more as the course progresses. Let's check if the about page is working. Inside the address bar, type in the URL we specified inside the conditional statement, which was slash about. The message on the page should now be about page. Lastly, let's test out the 404 error. Just type in anything random. It doesn't matter. The page should now be blank, and if you look at the developer tools, you should see the status code appear as 404. This is perfect. We now have a server that can display certain content depending on the URL requested. We've also accounted for content that doesn't exist by returning a 404 error. That does it for this lecture. We've learned about the basics of routing, headers, and status codes. In the next lecture, we'll learn how to serve HTML files to the user.